appreciate creation of taxes, CRA's website, and understanding a lot of new financial terms that I've been part of the last year. I just want to emphasize this point over here. If you do not share your assignment with the TA's email address or my Gmail address, you cannot actually see it. TAs are not on the same system as you guys are. Undergraduates, you guys use different email systems. If you share it with our McMaster address, you cannot see your assignment. You cannot find it. You consider it and you've not handed it in. Please share it with our Gmail address here only. That's critical. So, as I, as I said just a minute ago, we only consider cash flow before tax, CFPT as it's sometimes called. However, there's, there's no option to avoid paying taxes. And we have to consider what the effect of that is on our cash flow. If you're working for the government itself, uh, or a non-profit government, you don't pay tax. Uh, but we will generally have to pay tax at a rate the student rate is 25% in this course. If you're a small business, your tax rate is substantially lower. It's 15 to 20%. If you're a regular size corporation, uh, there's a threshold beyond which you have to pay regular taxes. And we will assume for the most part that that averages out to 25%, although it will differ to every company. So, as we have said here, but we consider a case with high enough income that the tax rate will be considered constant. So, there's obviously a sliding scale up to you get to that point. But for, by and large, if you're working for a, a, a regular sized corporation as an engineer, uh, that's a good number to assume it's 35%. Now, depreciation is something we are very familiar with. Uh, we're, we're comfortable with the fact that any major capital expense that we buy loses value over time. And okay, so if any you own a car, you, you know or, or you know you have to own a car, you've never heard that expression, you just drive your new car off the parking lot and it loses a big chunk of its value. That's the depreciation that's kicked in right there as you as you start using the vehicle. Uh, there's wear and tear on the device, corrosion, rust. Uh, there's all sorts of changes that occur to that capital item over time that, that cause it to lose value. Uh, we do, we do um, be a little bit more, we could be a bit more specific about it. There's obviously the physical depreciation that occurs on the unit. So by that I mean, if you're talking about a piece of equipment in a company, the number of hours <coughs> that it is in service for is directly proportional to its, its remaining life. Um, for a car, the number of kilometers that you've driven on it would be the, the direct equivalent. Um, there's also just natural use, uh, sorry, natural depreciation that occurs, whether you use the object or not. If, I, if my car is just left in the parking lot, I don't even use it, it's still declining in value over time. There's rust that's taking place, corrosion on, on the parts of the vehicle. Even without use, there's still a, a loss of value. The same with any process equipment. Uh, our, most of our chemical plants are exposed outside. There's natural wear and tear from the environment on those units. So whether they're, we're running them or not, they're losing value over time. And then there's also functional loss. I, for example, um, bought class secondhand for friends. They paid $25,000 in 2001. I bought it from them secondhand in 2008 for $5,000. So that decline in value of $40,000 is, is a measure of the change in time of the value of the car. If I had to go sell the car now, I'd probably get less than $1,000 for it. Okay, so there's that depreciation or decline in the value of the object over time, um, which, we're, which we're going to try and take into account in today's class. There's also, uh, I mean, one reason why cars depreciate so rapidly is also because there's changes in style. For example, my car still has a tape deck in it. it has no GPS and doesn't even have an iPod jack. So these sort of, sort of things that make it lose its value as a resale object all the time. And so there's, there's that depreciation as well. In, 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 so styles change, new technology comes in. So obsolete technology is not is not the best favorite. Um, for example, if you're, going, if you're going to find it tough to sell your iPhone first edition to anyone who's looking to buy an iPhone. So in a chemical plant, it would be the equivalent of safety features. On an old piece of equipment, it may not have the safety features 
and operational efficiency that newer equipment has. So we have all those types of loss of value. So it's due to time itself, whether we use the object or not, due to corrosion that, um, and so on. Then the second one is due to the number of hours that we use it. And then thirdly, just due to the lack of features that that object has considering uh, newer technology. So depreciation is that loss in work. And at the end of its life, we're going to have to replace that unit with something newer. Um, so the government actually allows, it's, it's very interesting, um, they allow companies to expense that loss in use. I, as a taxpayer, cannot expense the loss of the value of my car's depreciation. I cannot put on my tax return that I believe my car is low in value and, and write that off as a cost. Okay, let's look why. The main, the main thing that you need to understand from today's class is this equation. Income minus expense is obviously a profit. Okay. As a taxpayer, I pay my tax on the proportion of my net income, which is the total gross income, minus the very short list of eligible expenses. I can only deduct my groceries, my gas bill, and housing expenses. Those I cannot deduct. The list of expenses you can deduct as a taxpayer is very, very short. You pay tax on that. Companies can deduct a lot more in this area before they get to pay tax on their property. So then the next line is the following. Profit minus depreciation times percentage tax rate. 35%. That's dollars times paper. So corporations pay tax after they deduct a long list of expenses. I could also conceptually in, in, infer that depreciation is an expense. I could conceptually put depreciation in there with the rest of the expenses and then multiply by the tax rate. I would get the same answer. Okay, but I'm breaking it out here separately for you. The government of Canada will actually consider depreciation as an expense, but for conceptual reasons today, I'm breaking it up to explicitly show you that depreciation reduces our profit and therefore reduces the amount of tax we end up paying. Why is this important? Because so far in our NPV calculations, we've simply said that NPV is the sum of the cash flows divided by in the time value of money. And we've said that that CI so far is uh, income minus expenses. Okay, but we've forgotten one critical expense. It's not depreciation. Depreciation does not go in here. It's minus tax page. That's our net income. So all our NPV calculations from now on are going to include a new term before we decline them for uh, the time of money. We're first going to have to calculate the tax paid on that capital asset, and then we calculate our NPV. So our NPVs are going to be substantially different. So if you understand what's on the board here, you've understand, understood today's class. The only part we haven't yet figured out yet is what goes in there and how much is that. The rest of it is straightforward. We just need to really focus on what's that depreciation. Okay, so the government of Canada allows very, very special circumstances to corporations. They get to deduct their expenses and depreciation of their tax. As, as a regular person, you do not get that luxury. So there's a question, is that fair? If that's a you know, philosophical thing regarding tax law. So let's take a look. I just want to take a look for a minute. Um, I'm being a little bit glib by saying you cannot take depreciation off on your personal tax return. In fact, you can. If you go to the Government of Canada's website, 
go put on individuals, tax returns, eligible deductions, employment expenses. There are a very limited list of capital cost allowance items. That's code for depreciation. So CCA is simply depreciation. What can you claim as CCA? Uh, there's, there's a number of things that you can claim, and there's a number of terms there that you need to be familiar with. But for personal taxpayers, that list of what you could, can claim is quite short. Uh, if you're a musician and you have to buy your own musical instrument, um, and you're earning income as, as that musician, that's one eligible source of expense. Very limited cases, you can deduct your motor vehicle expenses as an eligible employment expense. There's not much else that's on the list. Very, very short, short list. So from an individual's perspective, so under the individual section of the CRA website, you can go look at, at some of those. I'm going to close those because we're not interested in that. But now what I do want to look at is the business section of the Canada's website, on the CRA. So under business, sole proprietorships and partnerships, and a lot of this also counts for corporations. Um, what's an eligible business expense? In other words, what do you put in there? What's allowable in there? We want to maximize, as a business, absolutely everything that we can legally expense for tax purposes, right? Because the more we have in expenses, the less tax I pay. So there's several ways you can pay less tax. You can earn less income, you pay less tax. You can have more expenses, you pay less tax. And you can have greater amount of depreciation. So what is allowable? as a business expense, uh, CRAs, you can, as a rule, you can deduct any reasonable current expense you pay or will have to pay to earn your income as your corporation. You cannot deduct personal expenses, deduct only the business part of the expenses. You cannot claim expenses you incur to buy capital property. Uh, we'll look at some of that. Uh, and then there's a list of eligible expenses. I can claim advertising. If I've done a service for another company and they don't pay me, I can write up that debt. Uh, startup costs, we'll talk about that in a minute. The cost of starting up your business or putting in a new piece of equipment and starting it up, that's allowable. Um, if I have to pay any taxes and license fees, uh, home expenses, then here's the two that I'm interested in in today's part. Capital cost allowance, depreciation is an allowable expense. So this is where I said conceptually, I could put this term in there. That equation on the board does not change. So CCA for depreciation is allowed. Uh, delivery, uh, shipping costs, fuel costs, insurance, interest that the banks charge you, uh, maintenance and repairs for your, for your distillation cost. Any maintenance <coughs> costs, repairs on that uh, exchange you have to make. Any management and administration fees, yields and entertainment, that's up to a certain allowable limit. Uh, property taxes, rent, salaries. A corporation can deduct all the salaries it pays as an eligible expense, which is a huge chunk of money. So after all the income, subtract all these list of expenses, they'll only pay tax on the net amount left after that. And they pay tax at a lower rate than a person does. So corporations get a good deal from the government. Salaries, supplies, telephone, utilities, travel, and other expenses. Mm -hmm. So we're interested in today's part, what is CCA capital cost allowance? <laughs> okay, so here are a few things to reflect about capital cost allowance. We will introduce this term, for the most part, use the declining balance method to calculate CCA. We're going to look at the declining balance method and we're going to look at, at a simpler method as well. And then there's some terminology further down here for the forms. So it's terminology that we call There's a nice, there's a nice page of various terminology that we need to be comfortable with. Okay, here it is. So capital cost is the amount of the of the equipment that you pay. That you pay for appreciable property. Um, but it's close enough. The key ones that I want to, key terms I want to be comfortable with are capital costs. This is the cost of the equipment itself. Um, this, the page on the website I was looking for had a bit more detail. It, in fact, allowed you to even include the cost of installation of that unit, which is often greater than the cost of the unit itself in many situations. You'll see that uh, in a week or two time when we start looking at, at cost estimation. The fair market value. 
that's the price that you can get, the highest dollar value you can get for the property in an open and unrestricted market between a willing buyer and a willing seller. In other words, I'm not selling this property to my brother-in-law. Okay. The fair market value is the price I would get in a, in a real or fair environment. That's, the, that's going to be the equivalent of the salvage value. Okay, so there's, there's equivalent terms that we use in this course. You need to understand the CRA's terminology. Fair market value. Proceeds of disposition, that's the amount you received for your property. So there's a difference here. This is the amount you expect to receive. This is the amount you actually receive. This is the proceeds of disposition. When you actually do sell it, you may or may not receive your fair market value. And then undepreciated capital cost. This is the balance of your capital cost after accounting for depreciation. So this is the value on the books of the, of the capital item. So, for example, if I buy a distillation column for 100,000, it depreciates by 20,000 every year. Then the next year, the book value is 80,000. The following year, it's worth 60,000. That's the UCC, undepreciated capital cost. So the remaining capital cost after accounting for depreciation. Okay, so these terms are, are, are they're maybe uncomfortable for you or, or new. Um, they're not that hard to, to get hold of, though. Uh, please look at the CRA's website if you want more clarification. Okay. 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 okay, now let's take a look at how the CRA considers capital items. Well, let's firstly, uh, let's go back to the course notes rather and then take a look at, I'd like to just review this slide over here. So this slide is asking which of these are capital uh, items and which can be, can be uh, appreciated according to the Canadian government rules. So the general principle is that the a capital item a bill that can be depreciated must have the following characteristics. It must be used to produce income. So the company must purchase this device with a plan of, of using it to generate form, uh, some form of income. It must have a life greater than a year and it must lose value over time. Okay, so one thing that cannot be depreciated within that list. No, it's not. One thing that cannot be depreciated is land. So physical land that you purchase to build your, your, your factory or your manufacturing site, that cannot be depreciated over time because it does not lose value over time. Land is never allowed as a depreciable value. With the land may, you may not be able to get the money you did, but by law it's not considered a depreciable item. Okay, so if we took a look at, at say, Dow, which of these, can they depreciate laptop computers? Yes. Yes, they can. Printer paper. It's used to generate income. Has a life longer than a year. No, printer paper is considered a supply. But that means that they can expense it up here. So it's still, a, they can still consider it an expense, but it can't be considered a depreciable capital item. Distillation costs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Pumps. Mm -hmm. yeah. They have life greater than a year, used to produce income, they lose value over time. Salaries? No. no. Not a capital item, but it is an expense. Office building? Mm -hmm. Ship it does it lose value over time? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Office buildings definitely lose value over time. Would you like to buy an office tower downtown that's 100 years old, or would you like to buy one that's 10 years old? <laughs> okay, company travel. It's an expense, but not appreciable. Internet connection fees is an expense. So, so there is a very, very clear list. At, well, I'm not going to say clear list. It's not a clear list. It's a long list of items that are depreciable. And these are the rates at which you can depreciate items. The government works in the sense of, of groups of assets called classes. So uh, they talk about each class here below. So let's just take a look here. Right at the first one is class one, a building. 
you may appreciate it at a full percent rate, but it, a lot of it depends on the state that you acquired it and the makeup that's the built. Number of sprinkler systems, electric wiring. A lot of this just comes from the fact that certain newer buildings have these features and can be appreciated at different rates than older buildings. Uh, class three, these are buildings acquired before 1988. They get depreciated at a higher rate. These are older buildings. Class six, including class six, at 10% rate, the building, if it's made of frame, log, or stucco. So these are very temporary buildings. But still depreciating if you're using them to make an income. So if you've got your, your sugar shack out in Quebec in the, in the backwoods somewhere, yeah, you can depreciate it 10%. 8% is a catch-all class. It's the class of property not included in other classes. So, um, it is actually a, a widely used. Class 10 is general process electronic equipment, commonly called computer hardware. <laughs> At 30% you can depreciate your laptop computers and uh, other, other desktop computers. Ten, uh, class 10 is vehicles. They depreciate at 30%. Class 12 is China cutlery, linen, uniforms. This is obviously targeted at the restaurant and service industry. Uh, but there's a few other things, DVDs, video cassettes that you do, that you rent or expect to rent. Um, eligible machinery and manufacturing, processing to make goods for sale or lease acquired after 2007 but before 2012. So there's a specific category for this. Class 43. Eligible machinery and equipment used for the manufacturing and processing in Canada of goods. So this is where your distillation column and pumps and so on would go. There's uh, another general purpose electronic, commonly called computer hardware and software. So here the government created a class, of a new class specifically between 2004 to 2007. And they did that to, to, boost, it, uh, to boost acquisition of these. So they allowed a higher level of depreciation greater than the 30%. Yeah. So you can even depreciate software on your laptop as well? Software is depreciable. If you're using it to make an income, it's got a life greater than a year and it loses value over time. So software is allowable as a depreciable item. Um, I'm not sure which class it is, but there is a class specifically for software. Okay, so there, class oh, okay. hardware and system software, that's class 45. Class 46 software. So the government puts puts categories in certain classes. Here's an interesting class where you can depreciate 100 percent of its value with no after rule. But this was only for equipment acquired between 2009 and 2011. Why do you think the government allowed that? Allowed you to depreciate 100 percent of the value. Specifically between 2009 to 2011. <laughs> But why that time frame? Okay. It's just after the recession, so it's to encourage companies to get back up on their feet again. It allowed you to depreciate the entire amount in one go. Okay, so that was nice. I mean, I, I bought a lot of computer hardware for my company at that time because I could write it off in one year. Um, so, so those are the general classes available to us. If we go back here, um, so these, are, uh, these slides are, are from Dr. Tom Marlin, who teaches this course at the University of California in January to April every year. So he has some very US specific terminology in here. The government defines what goods can be depreciated. Um, the CRA's website is the place to look for that. In this class, I will not go into too much detail. There's some detail that's very specific to Canada. Uh, we will just cover the general principles of depreciation. But the main point is that the company can reduce its income through the cost of its equipment. Okay? The reason is quite simple. If I'm a company, I'm getting my income. If I purchase a, a capital item, a distillation column and instrumentation and installation, and it costs me a million dollars, is it fair to write up that million dollars in the same year that I purchased it? So I reduce my income by a million dollars in one go, that same year that I buy it. Okay. And then only pay tax on the remaining amount. No. Well, from the company's point of view, it's not. Awesome. From a company's point of view, it's nice. From the government's view, it's not. But also from a fairness and an accounting perspective, it's not. Right. Yeah. And also, it's not making you income. Right? It's deductible and extra income. Right? Yeah. 
Right, but we're looking at, at the company's perspective in one financial year. They've got a ton of income, they're purchasing and paying for it in that same year, whether it's generating them future income or not. Okay, so from a fairness and an accounting perspective, it's also not right to expense that entire amount in one year, especially when you know that the unit is going to be operable over a number of years. So from a fairness perspective, it makes sense to break up the capital cost and installation costs, combine them, and then divide them over a number of periods, and then expense them by small amounts in every year. So, so that's exactly what we're going to do. Now, the following are expensed. Uh, we've looked at this on the website. Stock costs, repairs, and maintenance costs. These can be expensed. Working capital cannot be expensed. Working capital was the discussion we had a few days ago where we say these are things that you need to start and run your business. So supplies and catalysts and so on. Material that you need to keep your, your system running. That cannot be depreciated. I mean, sorry, that cannot be expensed because you're going to be buying them and, and you're going to reuse them again. These can be depreciated. Uh, we've looked at a few, a few of them um, already we've seen in the list. That obviously, the equipment itself. But interestingly, if you have to make an improvement to the equipment, you can expense that improvement cost. <coughs> if you have to do any upfront design and engineering and pay an outside company to, to do that work, shipping and installation can be expensed as part of depreciation. So when you calculate the value of the item to be depreciated, it's not just the money you pay for the physical equipment, but you add in the design for it, shipping and installation, and any site preparation required for it. So that's also on the CRA's website. Um, of what is allowable. Um, I may not find it quite now. Okay, yeah, there's a site here. Current or capital expenses, so they ask. <coughs> a capital expense generally gives a lasting benefit. Um, renovations and extensions that extend the useful life of your property or improve it are usually capital expenses. To decide whether or not the current expense or capital consider the answers to the following questions. And then they go through a whole lot of scenarios down here. Um, is this expense part of a property or a separate asset? Does the expense maintain or improve the property? Does it provide a lasting benefit? Etc. Etc. Uh, so as you can see here, it, uh, you, just, you need to start having an experienced person who's comfortable with government regulations to really determine what the total value that we can appreciate. of depreciable assets. This is US specific. The Canadian government wants to publish on the website as well. Okay, so what we're going to do is, is, is now take a look at, at how we depreciate. So the moment we install that equipment, after we've done the installation and we turn it on for regular production, that's the time point when we start depreciation. So in many cases, for example, when I was working at Glaxo, there's at least a six month period after we've installed a piece of equipment where we're still doing qualification of it. We're defining where should I operate this piece of equipment, we're testing it on some scrap material to make sure that it works. That period of time is not, uh, that's like a free time period. You can start depreciating the, the equipment only after you put it into regular production. So that upfront period is not allowable to be depreciated. So what we're going to do is once we put it in service, we're going to calculate the time period over which we estimate this equipment will last, and then subtract that value off of it on a declining basis. So before we get to that, there's one other rule we have to bear in mind. This applies both in the United States and Canada. When we look at our time period, the time period is one year. And, you, and the companies will do this based on their financial year cycle. So for ease of use, let's assume a company cycle is January to December. That's the, that's the depreciation cycle. If I install that piece of equipment on the 1st of January and start running it and, and goes into regular production use on 1st of January, I can charge depreciation for that entire year because I'm using that equipment in production for that whole year. However, if I install and run a piece of equipment on the 30th of December, is it fair to claim a whole year's worth of depreciation? No, obviously not. So the government realizes that and says, 
no matter the first year of it, from when you put it into production, even if you use it the entire year, part of the year, or one day of the year, you're only allowed to claim 50% of the value that you would have otherwise claimed. Okay, and we have to obey that. So let's take a look at, at, the, at the ways we can decline our assets. So the first one is, of, is the easiest one. This is one that's not on the Canadian uh, government's website. I mean, it is allowed. You can choose to use this one. Uh, but generally, the Canadian government uses the, the next method that I'll show. But the straight line depreciation is available to you if you, if you choose. The principle is quite simple. You say, here's my assets lifetime. I'm starting the equipment for regular production use at time zero. I expect the equipment to last 10 years. So, so N, lowercase n is the life of the equipment. So that's the time I feel I, that, that lifetime ends. That's, a, that's you, the value you choose. So you have to, you have to have some knowledge of that. So here's the purchase and, and installation costs. I'm just going to call that B. Capital B dollars is the base cost. Installation, everything. And the straight line method is exactly what it says is let me decline up to time n. And at time n, I may get dollar S salvage dollars for that piece of equipment. In many cases, the salvage value is zero, but let's assume it's non-zero dollars, and the straight line method simply says decline at a straight line rate. So if I've got n years, I decline evenly over those n years. So my book value here starts at capital B dollars, then the next year the book value decreases by even amounts. The amount that it decreases by is here called D subscript T. D subscript T is the depreciation. In the time period. <laughs> In the time period. So that's the amount by which it's lost its amount. That's the amount that you can reduce your, your corporate taxes by. That DT is the depreciation you get to subtract off income minus expenses minus depreciation. That's the DT dollars that you get to reduce your income taxes by before you multiply by your percentage tax. So this one, this one's very straightforward, easy to understand. Key things here, the salvage value may or may not be zero at the end, often it is. And the other point to remember is it's up to you as the, in, as the uh, company to estimate the useful value. And that obviously is a fair value that has to be chosen. Uh, the government does provide guidelines for certain things like computers and so on. I think it's a five-year life for computers. But larger items like distillation columns and specialty equipment, they have no idea. But they will audit you if obviously you choose a three-year lifetime for distillation columns. That's going to be fair. Pretty, uh, wrong. Okay. So if we looked at this little example here, the ten thousand dollars piece of equipment, ten percent per year depreciation. Um, that's what that, that percentage depreciation is a is a number that you uh, get simply by saying D is one over N. The percentage rate that, at which it's going to depreciate is not over the number of periods you've used. So 10%, I do an estimated 10 year life, sell each other at zero, and $25,000 and I could get to zero. What's wrong with that? I'm not uh, tech, whether whether things actually pre depreciate like that or not. Of course, yes, we expect things to depreciate quickly at the beginning um, in proportion to their value. So that's the one we go with. It. Numerically and technically, what is inaccurate in that breakdown over there? Book value is zero. Is that wrong? 
I've assumed salvage value is zero. I've assumed that at the end it's zero. I'm not going to get any money for it. Yeah? Time value is not considered. Time value is not considered. This is, okay, yeah, no. no. We haven't accounted, we assume that we can deduct 100% of the depreciation in the first year. Okay, remember, we can only take off 50% in that first year. So that's that rule back up here. Uh, the government says that we'll assume that 50% of depreciation in the first year of its life can only be deducted. Yeah. So is that the same as the half year rule? That's the half year rule that you see in, in CCCA rules. Yeah. So I, I, for simplicity for this derivation, I just not put that in. But that, that is inaccurate. Okay. We should have deducted, a, say, deducted $500 in that first year. Then thousand, 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 thousand. That means that we will be bumped over into year 11 by another $500 before we reach a zero, zero dollar book value. So the correct way of, of doing that is put 500 in column one, then thousands, and then there will be another 500 remaining to Now, as was mentioned here, you know, obviously that doesn't, that doesn't look like reality. The reality is more along the lines of depreciation it does something like this in proportion. It's exactly a first order exponential decay. Uh, we're, we're declining in proportion to the value over time. And if I use a high percentage rate, this might be D equals 50%. In other words, it goes and loses half its value right in the first year. I use 50% as my, as my <coughs> My rate in, in one year, the equipment loses half its value. If I used a lesser rate, the store is going to keep going down. That might be D is 10%. You can get more and more and less at risk, depending on what that depreciation rate is that's given uh, by the Canadian government's website. So the, depending on the class of equipment that this is, that rate changes uh, and the severity of, of the so here's the, here's the general uh, rule. The depreciated amount in period T is proportional to the book value. So the book value is the amount remaining. The, the UCC, the un, I forget those acronyms on the Canadian government, but it's basically book value is the original value minus the depreciated amount. That's here actually the next equation. So in proportion to the book value, we multiply by the depreciation rate. And that depreciation rate is what's given on so here's an example, and then we'll actually do an example quickly. Um, if I start with with a no, let me not do this one. This is double defining value. Let me just do a regular defining value example. Here, we'll just do this one together. So, if I consider an asset that's worth ten thousand dollars, I expect it to have a lifetime of more than four years with zero salvage value at the end. Let's calculate the straight line method, declining balance method, and then the double declining balance. So an asset of ten thousand dollars, four, four years, like what is the, the rate at which I, I decline by the straight line? What's the percentage rate? Twenty five percent. The rate is one over n, which is one over four point two five percent. So if at year zero. My, my, my book value is $10,000, that's the cost of installation and, and of the capital item itself. The next year, N1, I get to depreciate that by $2,500, 25% of the original amount. And there's my depreciated amount. I'm just going to just call it half. And then over here, I'm going to just keep track of my book value. 
Now, I'm going to just also, just to, for simplicity, I'm not going to take into account that 50% rule at, at the start. Uh, we'll do that in the tutorial on Monday. But for now, just to explain the concept, um, and maybe three rules, you'll assume that the 50% rule doesn't apply. So my book value after depreciating for 2,500 is then 7,500. The next year, I simply just depreciate by 2,500. So the depreciation is constant in every period. That's the key simplification for the, for the straight line method. So the next year then, the book value is 5,000. The third period and the fourth period, similar idea. Simply depreciate by 2,500 every year and the book value declines until it reaches zero dollars in that final year, which is its expected life. balance method, the, the rate at which you decline it by is exactly the same rate, 1 over n, which is 25%. But the book value changes over time in a different way, and the depreciation changes. In the first year, you get exactly the same calculation. So you depreciate by 25%, so in other words, 10,000 times 25 <coughs> is 2,500, your book value remaining is 7,500. But then the following year, you depreciate in proportion to your book value. So the amount that you depreciate by is 7,500 times 0 0.25, which is uh, 1,875. value then is $5,625. In the third year, 5625, the book value times the depreciation rate gets you, you pay less depreciation now, which is $1,406, and your book value is 4219 Final year, uh, in the fourth year, it's not the final year, 4219 times 25%, you're paying $1,055 depreciation, and your book value is 3164 So you haven't actually reached zero dollars. That's one, that's the main objection with the declining balance, is as you know with an exponential decay, you'll actually never reach zero. So our value actually, the decline is, is substantially less. In the first year, we go from the same as, as there, but then it, goes, it takes just, it shouldn't look like a straight line, so it should be perfect. It um, will decay, but at a, at a slower, slower rate. Okay, so it will take a long time to, to actually get to zero with the declining balance. And in fact, I can go to a fifth, a fifth period if I need, uh, and I should. Um, that, that depreciation keeps going for a number of years until you get to a book value of zero, or, or you scrap the equipment. So the key thing with the declining balance is my estimated life is going to be exceeded on the depreciation. So to counteract for that, um, there's the double declining balance, which is, is what it is. Uh, your rate then is 2 over n, or 50% in this case. So let's take a look at that. In my first year, the depreciation that I get billed for is 50% of the $10,000. I get to write off 
$5,000 of depreciation that very first year with a double declining negative. My book value remaining is $5,000 or so. The next year, book value times 50% gets me to $2,500, which then also coincidentally, these numbers just work out this way, makes my book value $2,500. Next year, the numbers work out exactly the same, so 2,500 times 0.5, which is to 1,250, and your book value is 1,250. The next year, you're paying $625, or you, you can write off $625 in depreciation, and your book value is 625. Just, it's just the way the numbers work out that a 50% rate, your depreciation matches your book value. And then your double declining balance would be, so I've gone from 10,000 to half the value, and then to half of that still, half of that. You're declining exponentially very, and you'll get to zero just after the straight line effort. You'll cross zero sometimes. So double declining is 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 a, is, is a is probably a fair representation. It recognizes that in the early years it loses a lot of its value and then that tapers off over time as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a more aggressive initial declining rate in your book. Thank you. 